On the Tape is presented by CME Group, where risk meets opportunity, and iConnections, reimagining how the investment industry connects. January 21st, Dan, 2022, does that mean anything to you? No. It means nothing. It means a lot to me. Because on that day, we were celebrating the 15, one five-year oh. anniversary of CNBC's Fast Money, and we did it with Melissa Lee of CNBC's Fast Money. Now, let me say this. I'm the oldest of five children, as you know. I have two brothers and two sisters. We know this. We all know this. You could Google it. It's in the Google machine. I will say this, and I mean this sincerely, and I probably said it two years ago. Melissa Lee is as close to a sister as I have outside my two biological sisters. We've been together on this show now seemingly forever. We met each other before she started doing the show. I remember exactly where we met each other. Mm. I think it was at the New York Public Library, if I'm not mistaken. You're right. At some CNBC event. You're right. You were there with Mary Thompson. You're right. Mary was having a few cocktails. You were having a scotch. And we yucked it up. And I said, you know what? She's pretty cool. And as it turns out, some 16, 17 years later, she's pretty 17. cool. 17. We can do the math because you just said... Jan 15, 2022. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mel, welcome back to the On the Tape podcast. It's great. Isn't it back. wonderful having her back? It really is. It's like home. No, it's not. This is not home. You don't feel like no, you're home. No, with here. you guys. Oh, with us. Yes. 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 And and she gets to do the easy stuff. She gets to answer the answer questions. Answer questions, yeah. which, which is, is important. It is. Important. So let's start with this. And I've said this a number of times. You are extraordinarily talented. You could host any show on the network at any time of day with any moment's notice. That's factually true yet you go on to do these documentaries and i think this latest one big shot is it your sixth please correct me if i'm wrong it's my 10th stop wow. it it's your 10th it's my 10th 10 and a half because one documentary i was interviewed as an expert amazing well big shot came out we watched it it's amazing so before we get into that how do you even think about these things obviously you're privy to all the stories that are important, what's going on in the world, and the little light bulb goes off. And I'm sure with the GLP ones, that's exactly what happened. But the idea, how do you set it in motion? Like, just walk us through how these things happen. I want to say that it's more than just a fad. I want it to be in the news and of, of you know, mainstream interests. I think those are the two main things. And then also, this is basically, you know, a work that I do on the side. Mm -hmm. It's like an extracurricular. So is it a topic that I feel so passionate about, so interested in that I'm willing to spend my extra time devoted to researching this and reporting this? And the answer, hands down, was yes, especially to this topic, to every project that I pitch. Yeah, Mel, so this one is kind of interesting. So you said you've done 10 of these and it's, you know, we used to mess around a little bit because we've been on the desk as she's been promoting each sure. one of these. Mm. So there was a uh, one on porn. Excuse me? Yes, there was. There was one on Coca-Cola. The business of porn. The business, bi sorry, yes, The yes. business of porn. There yes. was one on cannabis. Sure. Mm -hmm. there the big was, smoke. There was one on Bitcoin. I made that up. I right? it, it was <laughs> that that would have been good. Though. But this one is the big shot, and it is about, like, right now, it is actually in the moment. I feel like that the, the Bitcoin one, you caught it after one of the big moves, mm -hmm. uh, and then it was obviously there's been plenty of big moves. This one is happening like right now. And so you had access to, you went over to Denmark and you went and interviewed the CEO of Novo Nordisk. Mm -hmm. This is a company now that's over, has half a trillion market cap. It's bigger than LVMH. It's bigger, mm -hmm. it's the biggest market cap company in Europe. Europe. And right now, obviously they're competing with Lilly. They've been competing with Lilly for a hundred years on diabetes drugs. Yeah. Like, and I know you learned that a little bit during this thing. Talk to us a little bit about like being in this moment. You had Dr. Scott Gottlieb on your thing. You had amazing patients, and we'll talk about some of the stuff that's going on with some of them. We had our good friend Zach Rotano from uh, Roe on there. They were a distributor of these drugs. Mm -hmm. What does it feel like to be in the moment? And like, I feel like the story is like evolving, and you just did a big report on it. I feel like there's going to be a follow-up to this one, too. You know, it's when I first pitched it, I was worried that, that the craze would be over mm -hmm, yeah. in some way, um, but it really hasn't. The story has just evolved. The story has evolved from the standpoint of not just innovation in the drugs, which is which is ongoing, which is going on to this day, um, but also how investors are looking at this class of drugs. At first, it was sort of like a winner-takes-all mm -hmm. mentality, where you would see the actual transfer of market cap away from certain sectors to Novo Nordisk and to Eli, Eli Lilly. And as time went on, people understood 
started to understand that the effects wouldn't be immediate to that degree, and it would be in some sort of a, a degree. You know, some market cap would go away from snack food companies, but how will those companies, for instance, have to evolve the products that they make in order to, uh, you know, cater to this new class of people who are taking these drugs, mm -hmm. maybe more protein-packed sort of snack items or drinks, et cetera. So it's interesting to see how the, how how we think about the impact on society has evolved. Also, you know, the idea that the total addressable market is every single person who is affected by obesity, mm -hmm. that's not necessarily true. As we come to understand mm -hmm. now, we understand more that the for insurance, if an employer is covering a, a, a person, every employer spends about roughly $7,000 per employee on healthcare costs per year. If you think about GLP-1s, that could add another 12,000. It wouldn't necessarily be adding 12,000 because it would be taking away some of the money that was spent you on other hope. procedures right. you would hope, right. Um, but right now it doesn't, it doesn't add up in terms of the cost for the employer. So maybe the total addressable market is something more like people who can either afford it plus the people who have insurance c coverage for it, which is a smaller subsect from everybody who's affected by obesity. But with that comes a great deal of competition. What I learned after watching it, yes, competition is coming, but in terms of Lilly and Novo, the head start they have, mm -hmm. I don't want to say it's unsurmountable, but it's pretty daunting for a lot of other people. So, you know, they're light years ahead of everybody else. The market will catch up, but there's a window of opportunity for them, obviously, to continue to grow in the valuations that we talk about on Fast Money seemingly every night. Oh, absolutely. I mean, even in terms of not just the science of the drugs, but also the manufacturing capability, Novo just spent, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars on a new facility in Denmark and also one in Lex Lexington, Massachusetts, where they're doing sort of the, the R&D, you know, where they are for right now, they're, they're sort of starting to think about this molecule or a molecule that will be more like a vaccine that will be a once yearly injection. So innovation like that. Um, but their head start is in all these ways that require a tremendous amount of capital that these startups just do not have. And they do have a window. I mean, and you know, you can look at it in a couple of ways. For instance, Novo Nordisk, you know, their patent expires uh, somewhere in 2030, I think three. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it is expected that Medicare will, will put on the list semaglutide at some point, like in 27. But in the meantime, they have all this runway to sell as much, you know, GLP-1 as they can and also find the next innovation. Mm -hmm. And they've, they've been working on that since the day, you know, they developed semaglutide. They, they're not just sitting still based on this one discovery. How has, in your opinion, the skepticism about these drugs changed since you started covering this story really closely? Because I know in my own personal life what it's meant to me, and I know what a lot of my doctors and mm -hmm. people in the healthcare have said. It seems like a lot of the skepticism has kind of moved aside. I think at first it was really regarded as, as a vanity drug. And so there was a, a bit of skepticism like, mm -hmm. oh, yeah, you just want to lose some weight. But as the science started coming in in terms of the, the, the data um, that proves that it does improve cardiovascular mm -hmm. health, that the select data from Novo Nordisk, which, which showed a 20 percent reduction in cardiovascular events among people who've already had cardiovascular events, that is game changing. I mean, that could really mean tr not just for people like you in terms of, you know, improving your your cardiovascular health, but also think about it from like a product productivity standpoint. If you, for instance, Dan, did not, you know, go on Wagovi mm -hmm. and you you were still, you know, affected by obesity, you had heart problems, you had a heart attack, you're out of the workforce for a month. Multiply that yeah. by mm -hmm. X number of people, you know, and for all these other ailments, sleep apnea, for NASH, which is the fatty liver syndrome, all these other things where it is being studied currently. Think of the gains, I have all those potentially. But, but I've told you, like, I have sleep apnea. I don't it's, snore anymore. Right, I sleep amazing. better, so I wake up every morning. I have more energy, so I work out more. So right. that's better for and you're more productive. And I'm eating better. I'm, yes. you know, all those sorts of things. So that's why when I say every doctor mm -hmm. that I go to, and I'm also, here's another one. For the fatty liver stuff you just mm -hmm. mentioned, I'm drinking much less. And so at my age, my doctors want me to drink less, you know, for yeah. a whole host of reasons. So it's really kind of interesting. So like, did you walk away from all the doctors and all the, you know, the, the drug makers and all the people you, you had some amazing, I want to spend a little time on some of the folks that you um, met with who want to take the drugs, who are taking the mm -hmm. drugs, how it's changed your life. Did you walk away really um, a bit more optimistic? Because I'm sure you probably had to put a little bit of a cynical take on it going into it and trying to find what's wrong with this whole thing, if there is something. I think that a lot of the doctors are very optimistic, but I think that they do share some 
doctors are doctors and they're paid to worry a little bit, yeah. right? And so they look at what we do not know about some of these drugs. We do not know, for instance, the long-term effects of taking dosages at these high levels. Mm -hmm. We just don't know that yet. Um, and we don't necessarily know if the reduction of these comorbidities, these conditions that are associated with obesity, is because specifically um, the drug treats that condition or if it's just because it treats the weight mm -hmm. issue and that reduces the impact of these other things. And so the science is just coming in. So there's a lot we are still learning about this class of drugs, and I think a lot will be clearer in the next probably five years. Eddie Murphy did a skit. He talked about the only two things being permanent were herpes and luggage. Dude, mm. yeah, I used that, that on, on Steph Rule's show the other night. Really? really? Yeah. The same I, I didn't quote? say herpes, but I like said, luggage. I what said some you? of that stuff, you keep that, like Eddie Murphy said, you keep that stuff like luggage. Yeah. So I, got, I got a little laugh. Did you? That's did, did, was, wait, did you? You feel like I'm cheating on you a little bit, like doing the, the, the 11th room? hour? No. no that's no, just so family. different. Same yeah, okay. family. Same family. Sure. Guy has done it. Shoot, he was, he was a same star. Family. Yeah. But anyhow, I mention that because <laughs> this is now the third thing that's permanent in terms of once you're on it, at least everything that I've read suggests yeah. you're mm -hmm. staying on it. And to your earlier point, we don't know what the ramifications of that are. And for a lot of people that have come off it, they've seen the snapback effect has been right. significant. So- there's that, which leads to costs, which theoretically should start coming down. But right now, I think people are paying anywhere from a thousand dollars to fifteen hundred dollars a month. So you can do the math: twelve grand to eighteen grand a year, somewhere in between. For some people, uh, they can wrap their head around that. That's they're willing to make that payment. For a lot of people, there's no way that's going to happen. No. And to Dan's point, you interviewed a family that said, "I remember the gentleman saying, there's no way I can afford this,' right. which has led to the rise of these compounders." And it was a really interesting segment towards the end of your doc that talked about some of the upside of those and then obviously some of the serious downsides. So maybe speak to that. Unless they say that they are giving you Novo, a no, Novo Nordisk or Eli Lilly brand drug, always have just sort of that skepticism mm -hmm. around what kind of GLP-1 is being offered because these compounders, they operate in this sort of gray area where their facilities are inspected by the FDA, but the drugs they produce are not. Semaglutide and terzepatide, which is the active ingredient, terzepatide is the active ingredient in Eli Lilly's drug, they're in shortages. And so where are these compounders getting these molecules from? They're producing it out of something else, mm -hmm. which may not be as you know effective in terms of weight loss, and, and it may not be good for you, and you're introducing impurities in the process. And Dr. Scott Gottlieb, former FDA mm -hmm. commissioner, had mentioned also that there's no, oftentimes, there are no preservatives being added That's to right. these drugs either. So you're going in and out with a syringe every week out of this little vial, and you're introducing bacteria. And so even if the drugs themselves don't have an impact on you in a negative way, that bacteria could be. I 100%. mean, there are so many steps along the way where this could be you know, detrimental to your health. Well, the one patient, she was leaving it on top of a refrigerator, the syringe, right. so her son couldn't, didn't have right. access Right, just the empty it. syringe just and the, the vial in the fridge. So if you start to think, and again, compounders, mm -hmm. by the way, have been around a very long yes. time, and they serve, serve an extraordinarily purpose. important mm -hmm. uh, function in, in the healthcare pharmaceutical world. And I'm, we're not suggesting that there's something wrong here, but there are risks associated with that. And I think you have right to bring those up, and you don't know... It might be helping you without question, but the risks associated with using these because of cost or access mm -hmm. are pretty tremendous. And I think, you know, you did a great job sort of bringing that to light. With every batch that you get in the mail, there is a risk. Mm -hmm. And then not to mention, we didn't even touch on this in the doc, there just wasn't enough time, but there's counterfeit versions, there's bootleg versions, there's stuff coming in from China. There are all sorts of places where people see the demand for it. Whenever people see demand for it, they want to make money. Right. So this is easy. All right. It was a great doc. Um, I learned a lot and somebody who's been kind of adjacent to it this whole time. So we really appreciate the work that you do, Mel, on Thank those you docs. Guys. But hold on. Before yes. we go to the next, because I know you have a topic. But it's called The Big Shot. No, it's called Big Shot. It's not The Big Shot? No, it's, it's like it's Eagles. Oh. The band Eagles. Oh. It's not That's exactly what Eagles. I was thinking about. Really? When I, of course you yeah. were, because we think it's, alike. You're a fan of Godfather, the first movie and the second movie. Uh, sure, so yes. Yes, sure. of course you are. There's a third one, too. Well, no, no, there's not. That shall not but, be spoken of. <laughs> that's right. But <laughs> James Caan portrayed Sonny Corleone in the first movie, and he was he got shot on the causeway. I can't... They, they spoiler sh alert. Spoiler but, alert. But, well, but James Caan, when he saw the final version of The Godfather, he was upset 
because all the this footage he did, there were hours of footage that he did were left out. And he understood it was for the good of the movie and blah, blah, blah. But, you know, it's upsetting when you do all that work sure. and there are things that are left out. In an hour-long doc, which is probably 43 minutes-ish, you probably had hours and hours of stuff that you did. Days that you worth wish, of stuff. And this is not an indictment of anybody, but you wish yeah. made it but did not see the light of day. So speak to that because I think that's really interesting. What didn't make air that you were sort of upset about or wish it had? Um, when I dis- when I spoke to the family in North Carolina whose 12-year-old daughter was bullied every single day, had all sorts of comorbidities. She's um, pre-diabetic, is on blood pressure medic- medication. They cannot afford this drug. So they will just have to live the way they're living right now until, you know, Somebody says, okay, we will cover it on insurance, on, on Medicare. Um, the grandmother was crying because there are things that the, the granddaughter had not mentioned how she was being bullied at school. And that was really upsetting to the family. And I thought that really was very touching to me, that that the granddaughter, you know, mm-hmm. didn't even want to share those things. Like it, there's so much bullying happening that she couldn't have possibly shared every single thing that had gone on at school. And it's I bring terrible. that up because, I mean, there are, stories like that that are out there i mean it's so it's not just a vanity thing i mean obviously that's a Mm -hmm. small percentage of it but when you can make an impact on somebody's lives who's going through at that age sixth seventh grade bullied every day because of whatever reason in this case it's probably because genetic she was large that's heartbreaking stuff so if this can somehow fix that or go along with I mean, that's really important. I think also the I hope that people who are not affected by obesity or don't know anybody who's affected by obesity walks away from the stock with a better understanding that this is a disease. disease. The American Medical Association American Medical Association recognizes this as a disease as of twenty thirteen. And some a lot of people, you know, when I tweeted out promos for the doc or X'd out promos for the doc, said just put down the candy bars. That's it's not about no, that. It's no. not about that. And and there's still a lack of understanding in the general public about well, it's this. It's not unlike alcoholism and the stigma right. attached to mm-hmm. that. I mean, that's a disease as well. Just stop going to the liquor right. store. Well, you know what? It's you wish it's, it was that easy. It's, it's not. not. Yeah, you know, the mental health implications I think are huge. And I think there's I think you guys did a great job on the doc covering a lot of the other health care implications and destigmatizing some of the stuff. Um, you know, I, I you know, listen, I think you probably did an amazing um, job, you know, articulating why this should be covered on Medicare and Medicaid, that sort of thing. So I think that that's probably something we hear a whole heck of a lot more about in 2024. Um, big shot, the Ozempic Revolution. It's on CNBC.com. I think you can find it on there. Uh, it's going to be aired a lot more mm-hmm. um, on CNBC. So check your lo- local listings. Probably also on there. Check YouTube. Check your local listings. Do probably, people do that? Yeah, they do. Like uh, you don't do, you don't you? Well, I know I do. In the TV guide? TV guide. Yeah, guide. the one that you get in the mail. Readers Digest. The That's whole like, I look forward to that. Um, all right, so we had to do this. because <laughs> some great articles Because we, in we the wanted TV to guide. demonstrate how pro <laughs> we've become here at Risk Reversal Media Guy. Uh, because we had Mel in the studio here, Uh-oh. right? Are we, so, uh, have we demonstrated so, so it? We were we'll on. Our, by the way, you see this. Look at that. Oh, very nice. Cool. Very impressive. So we were <laughs> on. Well, you and I are on many nights a week. Mm-hmm. Um, in July 18th. Okay. It was right during July 18th. Q2 earnings season. And Danny Moses, our on the tape podcast partner, sure. co host, of, of the Big, Big Short, Short fame. fame. Okay. Mm-hmm. Was on with us that night. And we're just going to run the clip right here. So with stocks rallying and tech valuations nearing record levels, when will the bears throw in the towel? And I asked this in the company tonight. Basically, it's a bear den on the desk tonight. So we're going to have this conversation because it's a good one to have. When do you say you got to trade the market you have? You just got right into it. So we had Danny on the desk with us, okay? And you were like, and the market was basically right back at its prior yeah. all-time highs, okay? Uh, oh, you, had the, you, had, you had the move from the fall into the summer, yeah. unabated yeah. higher. Yeah. We obviously, I should say, I'll speak for myself. Well, no, you can you speak know, for me too. It's completely, fine. you know, not... A believer in the move for that entire period of time, and you asked, the, you saw the question, you yeah. saw that. So S and P was forty six hundred, and and we, I think, it was amazing to hear, and we were so glad. I mean, listen, you always hold us to the fire. I think the fact that Danny was with us, and you know that you, he's been doing the podcast with us, and for some reason, the three of us have just seen things very similarly mm-hmm. for the last couple of years or so. And I wanted to start with that because then over, and we felt like over the next couple months, I mean, the market, you know, sold off 11%, the S&P 500. And we feel like sometimes when you get those sorts of questions, it's kind of, I feel like we're kind of at a point like that a little bit. So curious as you see us, because, you know, guys been on- At an inflection point. Yeah. Like, I'm just curious, like, 
you know, how do you feel about pushing back on us? I think a lot of our listeners would like to hear about that because you were like, guys, are you not trading the market that you have? Mm -hmm. And you're not making a market prognostication or anything like mm -hmm. that. You're just kind of like taking in all the inputs that you do and everything like that. And you do a tremendous amount of work. Um, talk to us a little bit about that because we thought that was a really interesting moment. And I think all of us were like, okay, we're not going to get stuck again. I'm stuck again. I'm stuck again from a pundit standpoint, right. okay? Because I feel like as a trader, if I'm trading the way I always have, I can change my mind all the time. Sure. I cannot do that on your show. If I do that every night, I wouldn't have lasted a year, right? So we have to have a, a broad, uh, like, An I was stuck. We have to have a macro view, mm -hmm. you have to have micro views, and you have to kind of meet in the middle. And it gets kind of right. tough sometimes when you get stuck a little bit. I mean, I don't want to push back. It's, you know, I'm never going to say, oh, well, three days ago, Dan, you mm -hmm. said, that, you know, that's not fair. You know, I want to see how things play out as well. You know, most of the time when I listen to you guys, you make cogent arguments yeah. to use most a word of the that. Time. Most of the time. Ooh, right. That's like a ninety nine percent. I'm just leaving that one percent out just for you know, just for safety. Um, so I like to listen, and it makes a lot of sense. But at some point, after a while, you know, I hear from viewers, and they're like, "What is going yeah. on here? Yeah. You know, your panel's too bearish." And I have to step back and say, "You know what? Maybe that's true. Maybe it will do us all good if we step back and question our own." No, you have to our own prognosis, you know, prognostications, because I think everybody should, well, guys, and I know you guys appreciate it. No, but so. it's interesting. So, guy, do you? Do you uh, you look at responses in your Twitter? I stopped doing that a mm. long time. Does that factor into how you think about your voice on the show, your voice on the podcast, and stuff like that? No, I mean for me, it's, I mean I appreciate the comments, good and bad, but it's not going to. I, I tell people all the time, you should listen to everybody, but you shouldn't listen to anybody, and that's true across a swath of things. But specifically in terms of some of the positive feedback we get and the negative feedback, I mean I listen to everything, but I'm still going to do what I'm going to do. You can't change who you are, and I've said this a number of times. I remember what was going on in 2007 and 2008 vividly. And I remember how catastrophic it was for that nine to 13 month period of time when seemingly every night we were going on talking about something that nobody had ever seen before mm -hmm. and watching the market cascade lower on a daily basis. And people that then emailing us because it was pre Twitter, I wish nobody warned us. Why weren't mm -hmm. you telling us, you know, all those different things. And I'm like, you know what? I'm not going to make that type of mistake again. If I see things that are concerning, it's it's incumbent upon me to bring them up. Now, all the things that have been concerning me now for the last couple of years, they haven't gone away. What's changed, obviously, is the stock market's at all-time highs. So I'd love to be able to change my mind because all the things that I'm concerned about have cleared away, in the, but they haven't. In some ways, they've gotten worse. So that's the problem, of course, as the market goes up, each and every day, your voice becomes less and less listened to because of that. It doesn't mean the problems that you're bringing forth aren't out there and aren't as bad or worse. It's just the market has a way of sort of glossing these things over. Yeah, and Mel's point was like, okay, you guys are in a bit of an echo chamber. The three of you guys do a podcast. You like to talk about this. And, and I, I totally got that. That was obviously very helpful um, for us to hear. One of the things, Mel, though, that I think, you know, again, guy likes to listen and read and, and look around. I feel like most market pundits, most people who are pining on finance and the economy and stuff like that, they know that the whole business is levered to being long. Mm -hmm. And they speak to all of that always. And then they actually talk out of both sides of their mouth when things get a bit dicey. And and I feel like at least, you know, we don't claim we're not your hedge fund manager, right. you're, we're not your stockbroker, your investment advisor, this or whatever. And I know that we know just about as much of this as anybody else. And so if we're wrong, we're wrong, but we're probably wrong for like decent reasons and we admit it. So I'm just curious like how you think about that because I know that you, you do not suffer fools, you know what I mean? But like some of these folks have got really good at it talking out of both sides of their mouth and many big strategists at big shops too you know what i mean like never really admitting they're wrong and they're just kind of quietly tweaking their call and just moving on from there and then all of a sudden they come out with a note and they revisit their s p target for the year and then it's just it's like nothing ever happened mm -hmm. because you can revise your s p target five times before the end of the year and so each time you can change the direction where you you think the markets are headed um, I think that's why we we as a show, we don't put a lot of emphasis on where people's S&P 500 targets mm -hmm. are. I mean, a lot of other programs mm -hmm. might say, oh, you know, they just came out with this, you know, 5,000 target, whatever it is, whatever the target may be and touted. And we're just sort of like, you know, whatever. Like, that's not that important to us reaching that number. The broader strokes of are you bullish? Why are you bullish despite all of these factors? Or why are you bearish despite all these factors? That's more important. I think 
for our viewers, you know, I don't think they look to us for, you know, you tell me where to put my money. Right. They don't. You know, they're a smart crew. They listen to us because maybe they want to hear the counterpoint. Maybe they want to hear about the pitfalls of of maybe their bullish thesis. I think we have a very intelligent audience. I and so I that. think that, you know, every viewpoint is valuable, particularly and ones that are contrarian uh, for any given time frame. hundred percent. And, you know, one thing that I've learned over the years is everybody says they want to hear the truth. Tell me the truth. I want to hear the truth. And the reality is they, they, no. that's not really what they want. They want to hear what helps them get through the day go to bed at night, wake up in the morning, feel good about things. And sometimes the truth is painful. Now, again, all the things that we bring up, I mean, the, it's factually true what we talk mm -hmm. about in terms of the statistics and the things that are concerning me. What's humbling, obviously, is the market, which has a way of humbling everybody. I think what our show does an extraordinarily good job at, and Mel, you can push back or agree, the way the questions we ask of guests, the way we break down an earnings call, some of the some of the mm -hmm. conversations we have around individual names or sectors, I think is, you know, I'll put us up against any show on the network. Oh, I mean, I will say this and this is public. <laughs> I think that Fast Money is the best show on CNBC because of the different viewpoints and the instant analysis that we can offer. We have four experienced traders at any given time offering their perspective on any sort of breaking news or event of the day. And you cannot get there, that from anywhere else. And I think there is a real um, service that uh, we provide viewers. Yeah, the, I mean, the debate, I, I think, is is like, the, that, that's the thing that I find really fun. I find times yeah. like this really hard because like, I'm just looking at a screen right now, okay? And I'm looking at NVIDIA because I mm -hmm. probably spent a lot of time looking yeah. at NVIDIA. And you pushed back on me, rightfully so, on many times. I think my fundamental take on this company is probably as good as anybody's, but I'm just taking a slightly different view from an investment standpoint because I know that a stock that is doubled, okay, in let's call it four months, gained a trillion dollars in market cap uh, based on what the forward expectations are about a technology that's still unfolding that's gonna take years, if not decades to do, I know that will correct, okay? And you could say it's really different this time. Well, already gaining a trillion dollars in market cap, all right, doubling in that short amount of time, well, that's different, no doubt about it. But what won't be different is that when the thing gets cut in half, and Guy, you said this uh, numerous times over the last week or so, I think it's really important. More money, uh, more people will lose money in it than have made money in it. That's just a fact. That was the case in Bitcoin in 17. It was the case in Bitcoin just a few years ago. It was the case in the dot-com era. It was the case in the lead up to the financial crisis, whether you were investing in, you know, second homes or, or, or you, know, it, you know, whatever the hell it is. We know that. That's like, that's going to happen, right? And so I guess my only point is, is like, I'm not here to navigate you into a bubble. Like, that's not what I'm here to do. Mm -hmm. uh, if anything, I think the most important thing, and I think this is what you're talking about with the financial crisis when you guys started the show is help you avoid the pitfalls of FOMOing into this stuff at the wrong time. And if I sound redundant and if I sound like a perma bear, that's fine because we sounded that way with Tesla all last year right. and we were right about Tesla. You know what? The stock is down 8% right now, 8% on a headline out of China, okay, about deliveries last month. We've been saying they have a huge China problem. Mm -hmm. We were saying they have a huge competition problem. We were saying they have a huge Elon Musk problem with him alien, okay? Like, it's all happened. Right. So, like, I'm telling you, at some point, NVIDIA is going to come undone, and let's just, you're going to know the reasons why. You know why we told you, you didn't, we didn't get you long. But like you're not going to be long it because of it. I know that's a, is that a little bit of a rant? No, but no. it's a little bit of a I rant. Think that's, it's, I, little, it's fine. I think that's fair. I think the one pushback though is that if we had listened pushback. to you, Dan, then we would have been out of the stock, you know, three hundred points. Three hundred points. Throw me in that as well. No doubt, Mel. But I don't make recommendations. That's first and foremost. Okay, so everything I do is likely you know tied together with a whole host of different inputs that I would use as any long idea or any short idea. And and again, when I suggest shorting anything, and you push back on me, last year I tried to short. I'm doing this for if you're listening in air quotes here, people. I use options. I define my risk. Trust me. Okay, like I never would suggest being naked short an option, naked short um, a, a stock, especially a stock like this. But here's the thing that I've learned, Mel, and you know one of the things about being like I grew up in the institutional world. We were taking lots of risk. And we could change our minds really quickly. We didn't have a mic or a camera in front of us mm -hmm. or this or whatever. Okay, but here's the deal. This is what I've learned from being on with CNBC and meeting hundreds, if not thousands, guy of retail people over the years. Is like 
they don't have the expertise they, of, about knowing when to, this is risk management, to take a gain when something just is too easy right. and came too easy in an environment where everything feels, they don't know how to take losses, okay? And they get stuck with stuff. And I remember this going back to 2000. I had friends of mine asking me, I'm still long Yahoo at $3 down from 100, you know, stuff like that. And then I saw it into the financial crisis with other risk assets and stuff like that. And I've seen it again and again with crypto and shit coins and the list goes on and on and on. So I guess my point is, is every, if 90% of the people who are going to come on financial TV or have a financial podcast or on Fintwit or whatever it is, and they're generally really bullish and they're, they're basically pointing fingers, another rant, I'm sorry. Um, and they're pointing fingers at the guys who are keeping you out of it or whatever, who are the ones, you know what I mean? Who are telling you when to take a profit? Cause no one ever does that or how to manage risk. So I'm just curious, like how you think about it in that regard. Cause we don't always have the ability to go into long form conversations on the desk and stuff. No, I mean, I think that you make clear and I think that we try and make clear how you are doing it um, mm -hmm. in options and that it may not, it may be too complicated for the average person and that you can change your position at any time. I think that we, you know, we try and do a service to people in that way in terms of explaining the context in which you're telling them that you are, you yourself are short the stock, directionally short, not short, but using yep, options. Yep, yep, yep. Um, and I think that's the best we can do. We, we can only give people the fullest information. And, and this is your position. Yeah. I mean, you're just telling people about your position. Yeah, but I'm not what doing they it. what they want to do with that information is up to them. All right. So, what do you think about this idea, Mel? Like when people say, "Well, he's just talking his book," you know what I mean? Like everybody's talking their book. I don't right. care who you are on Wall Street. Everybody's right. well, got a book the they're point talking. Of the show is exactly <laughs> right. that. So right. people say that as some sort of indictment, but the reality is that's what we're tasked to do. Right. Because theoretically, if you think about it, that's what you want people to be doing. They want you want to hear what they are doing. So, in Yes, I mean, people are talking their book. Now, I understand the stigma attached to that, but it actually is ex exactly what you want from the people you're watching. It's so television. funny. I had so many people who would come to me because we were talking about NVIDIA a lot into their re earnings report. And, you know, we could put together nice little option structures and this and that, whatever. It could be stock replacement, collar. And I had so many really smart people who were along this thing. It was like, oh, I really like that idea. And they don't have mics in their face. They're not going on TV. Like, right. I think a lot of folks don't realize how hard it is. They think you and I are chamoles because we're like rolling mm -hmm. up at the NASDAQ at five o'clock. You know, the, the ability to get people who have our experience in the markets be able to do this, I'm just telling you, it's nearly impossible. I've been in the business for 25 years. Guy, you've been in, what, 45 years or something like that at this point. It's really hard. So it's just kind of funny that you're damned if you do, you're damned if you don't. I don't really give a shit, actually. I'm not a big, you know, I didn't do well on my SATs. That should come as no surprise. Of course and, you did. George Shannon would not allow. And people used to say, like, the person sitting next to me used, used to take copious notes, and, yeah. and I would just nod my head because I didn't know what it meant. But I've come to the learn what copious. it means. Take means like you're taking notes, like you're sitting there and you're paying attention, right? Cheapest thing you can do. You say, "What are you talking about?" For those out there that don't know, you have reams of notebooks with notes on every single day, every single show. I mean, going back now, it's coming up on 15, 15 years. years. Mm -hmm. So speak to that because I will tell you, and you're not going to agree with me, but this happens to be true it would be very easy for you to come on the show each night and sort of mail it in. Cause you know, you're the people on the desk, you know the question, but you don't, you're still as, as engaged now as you were when you started hosting the show as a replacement for Dylan when he was out. And then when you took it over full time 15 years ago. So speak to that rigor. Um, I, I think it's just the interest that I have in the markets and, and the way we stack the show, we are only stacking it with interesting stories. So it's stuff that I find personally interesting. I also know that um, to have success in this kind of business, you're preparing every day, not just for that day. There is so much in that notebook that I will take notes on that is never spoken of mm -hmm. on that day or the next day or the next day. But the next week, something will happen. And I'll flip back and I'll know exactly where it is in that notebook or it'll be in my brain because I wrote it down. Um, and, and that's where I think, that's how you have longevity in this, probably in this business, but in your bit, in the sort of the trading finance world, but also in my business where you're just ready for anything that comes your way. 
You know, it's interesting. I just bought a bunch of pencils and a notebook. Um, Did you about a like old-fashioned yes, pencils, old not and stylus? A pencil, no, no, and a little <laughs> pencil sharpener. It's on my desk out there. And it's funny because I want to start writing more. I think in this digital age, we're like bookmarking a lot of stuff, we're saving a lot of stuff, and everything. You never like go that. back to that stuff. Yeah, links no, and all but that. that's a that's a that's a Mel Lee sort of. Uh, well, sort of trick. there's a great line as Mel remembers in the great Mighty Van Halen, the song "Hot for Teacher." Of course, she does. Where he where he says, "I brought my pencil," and yeah. then we. we to say that all the time now you mentioned <laughs> pencils and it's probably this is interesting as well you have two little kids mm -hmm. four years old mm -hmm. i mean unbelievable it goes by in a flash so not only you are you know i would i would submit and i'm biased but doesn't mean i'm wrong i mean you are the paramount anchor on the network without question i mean we can argue you know you're also a mom of two very young how do you manage that and there are a lot of a lot of people out there doing similar but how do you deal with it I'm very good at compartmentalizing. So when I'm with them, I'm just with them. When I'm at work, I'm just at work. And I can put, I can completely separate those two things. I'm almost machine-like in that way. And that is a God-given gift. I know that because not everybody can do that. No, that's <laughs> absolutely true. I mean, as much as I'd like to think that I can compartmentalize, first of all, I don't know how to spell it. So, <laughs> but I, you know, it's very hard. And you bring a lot of stuff home with you in, in our world, the trading world for sure. But, you know, to the extent that you're on TV every night and you're dealing with the pitfalls of shit, I was wrong about this. I got this right. I mean, that roller coaster, it's very hard to compartmentalize. So what you have there is a gift without question. As soon as I say mad money starts right now, bam, I'm off. <laughs> All right, let's That's talk over. about this. So we talk about like again, this show's called Fast Money. We're talking about like obviously the most relevant stories of the day. You've actually had the benefit of like looking and seeing how the the stories have been covered throughout the course of the day, who the guests have been, what the takes have been, how the stories have evolved. I think that's the beauty of our show is like we actually have about an hour to see how the dust settled mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. Do you ever get like I know you guys can't trade. You can't, and you know, like you have lots of restrictions and all that sort of stuff. Do you ever just want to like trade this stuff? You've been doing yes. this now for how many years? Have you been sitting on the desk with us? And yes, being like, I would probably be bankrupt by now if I no. were allowed to trade. You probably have That's, a podcast no, by now. Not or true at all. Like I know that, you, you know I mean? because you're disciplined but, as hell, and you would have been an amazing trader because you'd be, you when you were wrong, you would acknowledge it. You'd get out when you're right. You would realize you're right, and you let your winners. I mean, you would be the Mark Fisher of trading without question, and Mark. For those who don't know, we'll put it in the show notes. I mean, he would come out and say that he's right 20% of the time and he's able to make money. And the reasons why is because when he's wrong, he knows it and he gets out. And when he's right, he levers stuff up in a major way. And you would be that person without question. Except I would probably get sucked into the smaller parts of the market because I love seeing like big stories play out. And then you have like these sort of, you know, group of smaller mm -hmm. cap companies trading along with it. And that sort of that kind of stuff catches my eye. So, so you I would do, be bankrupt. So you are, the, <laughs> but during the day, you're doing your own, like the same yeah. way we do our homework in whatever way that is. For us, it's just sort of paying attention, talking to people. You do your homework it's, as well. I mean, you have it's to. It's almost the same. It's almost mm -hmm. the same. So speak to that. Like what's a typical day for you? You're thinking about the stories for the show. For those that don't know, we have a call at 1230 Eastern time each day for the show. We have another call at 430 right before we go on. But in the interim, there's a lot of stuff going on. So- how do you spend that time preparing? Um, I, I usually get up really early and I just read everything that I can read. I'll read every single note that comes across. I'll look at what's going on pre-market, see what's going on overseas. Um, I'll disengage for a little bit, see how it settles out. Obviously, mm -hmm. pre-market's thin trading, so we don't really know how things shake out. So it's just I think that there are various touch points in the day for me where I can engage in the sh like what I need to do for the show versus – what I can do in terms of, you know, bigger projects like the documentary. So I'll have pockets of time where I know, you know, critical market periods. I'll make sure I, I re-engage, um, see what the show is lined up, see what sorts of guests. Um, but it's a constant communication. When you think our show starts at 5, you wouldn't need to start engaging at 6 a.m. Mm -hmm. or 7 a.m. or whatever it is. But you do. Um, because you do need to think about these stories and how, how you can change them, how you can reshape them to the end of the day, if you just plugged in at three, that wouldn't be any good. You're not you're not analyzing the story. You're just, you know, ripping and reading basically. In the early days of Fast Money, we used to not beg, but we used to ask people to come on. We'd have to reach out to people to come on. That's obviously changed considerably. Now it's a show that people actually look forward to coming on. So speak to that and how 
the transformation of the show during your 15-year tenure? I mean, I think that when I started, it really felt like I was doing somebody else's show. It was a show that was designed for a certain kind of host, for a certain kind of group of people. And then over time, it evolved. And I think it evolved to become a more open show, a more welcoming show, a, a more fun show. There's sort of a a bigger, you know, mm -hmm. component of, of laughter and joking and, and all that. And I think that reflects all of our personalities better. And I think that that's why we are able to be who we are on the air. I think when the cameras go off, we're all the same people. It's not like, oh, that guy, he's a completely different person off air or Dan or Melissa. I think we are all the same people on air. And I think that's what people love. And I think that's why people want to be on the show. They know what they're getting. They can trust us. They knew, know who we are. Um, and I don't think that a lot of other shows have that sort of genuine, uh, you know, it doesn't come through. Well, I'll tell you, having been on a number of different shows, typically in the commercial break of other shows, there's nothing going on. It's like crickets. They should actually <laughs> film some of the stuff that goes on during our commercial breaks because, to your point, there's a genuine affection between, you know, all the people that are on. And, you know, the family of Fast Money people has grown considerably. But I will tell you again, Without you sort of spearheading that entire thing, none of this would have taken place. It's, it's amazing. You know, I started doing the show, I think, regularly in 2011. So here we are 13 years later. Wow. And um, it's pretty fascinating because we literally, like, we're going to leave here and it's we're going to go up to the NASDAQ and it's going to be Karen and Tim and it's going to be Guy and me on the mm -hmm. desk. And I know we're going to have fun. Like, yeah. I know we're going to have fun. Even if it was a bad day in the markets right. for me or a bad day, I know there's a bad story lurking out there that I have to kind of fess up to. Um, it's been uh, like an absolute pleasure. I don't know about you, Guy. I never thought when I started doing CNBC in, in April of 2009 with Options Action, <laughs> With her, I never <laughs> thought I'd be looking a, like a decade and a half later and still be doing it. And I would not be doing it if I didn't love the product, if I didn't love the people that yeah. were doing with it. And the network, too, has been absolutely amazing to all of us. 100%. So. No, it's amazing. Listen, again, when they called me up in November of 05, and then this was a segment all through 2006, and we did a week in September of 06 where we did Larry Kudlow's time slot at 5 o'clock for the entire week. And it was pretty clear that something was going to happen. But if you'd asked me November, December of 06, how long the potential for this couple months, maybe at best. And here we are now, 17 years later. And in a lot of ways, you can, you can speak to it, Mel. You know, the show's probably never been better or in a better place. I think we're in a great place just because of the mutual respect we have, the relationship that we built over the years with each other. Um, and with the network, um, they trust us to try new things and we're constantly evolving. And I think, you know, every show is different and every year we try different things and we're not afraid to try something and fail. Huh, believe me, we've done that. <laughs> That's for sure. That is the great Melissa Lee, Big Shot, the Ozempic Revolution. Find it in your, what do you say, Dan? Favorite podcast. Store. Favorite Actually, podcast. Actually, on, on the YouTube, sure on CNBC, on the, yep. everywhere. Just get out your uh, Reader's Digest or whatever it is. Your, you uh, make fun TV of that. Guy. TV guide. TV guide. You know, one I day, know, I know. it's we coming know. all coming I back. Know. We know. Thanks, Mel. Thanks, Mel. Thank you.